Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today on a lovely spring morning after a bluey day yesterday. Um, uh, Heather's sister and her husband chose of all nights last night to come home in the boat from Scotland. So uh, um, I heard a desperate voice uh, speaking to Heather about half ten last night, um, uh, feeling uh, worse the wear for the, the bumpy journey across. But we were here in dry land, so that's OK. Um, give you a warm welcome today. If uh, you're visiting with us, you're especially welcome here in Ballyhome. Um, if you're watching online, you're also very welcome uh, as you join with us in our service. Just some of the announcements that we have for the incoming week. Um, uh, first of all, tea and coffee as usual after the service. Um, then the, the various uh, weekly groups, that's the Tuesday morning prayer group, making mornings, badminton group, prayer and toddlers, they all recommence this week at their usual times. Kirk Session are reminded of their meeting on Wednesday evening at half past seven. Next Sunday is the uh, United Evening Service in St. Columbanus at half past six. And then committee will meet uh, for their next meeting on Tuesday the 16th of April at half past seven. Then just looking um, a, a bit ahead, um, the ladies of St. Columbanus, uh, Ballyhome Parish, have invited our ladies to go on a walk with them, and that will be on Crawfordsburn Country Park um, on the afternoon of Saturday, the 21st of April. Um, it's meeting in the car park. We just have to confirm the time. Uh, we'll confirm that for you next week. Um, but it's just a, a come as you are and a, a cup of coffee at the end of the walk. And then also uh, the men's ministry, their next meeting is not the the uh, fourth Wednesday of April, but this time will be on the first Wednesday of May, and that's because uh, we're going to be on a tour of Stormont, and uh, for that, names need to be given to Billy McCubrey as soon as possible, and that's just uh, for the procedures for going to Stormont so that they have the names of those who are in attendance. Um, so if you would like to go and you haven't as yet, let him know, would you do so as soon as possible? And these, I trust, are our announcements for this morning. So this morning um, was meant to be our last look at Colossians. But when I started to read, um, I thought, whoa, there's actually a lot there and a lot of good stuff for us to think about there. So um, I've put the brakes on and I'm slowing down a wee bit. And we'll take a few more weeks just to go through the final bit of Colossians. This morning looks at the whole subject of prayer. And there's so much that could be said about it and so much that has been said about it. And um, whether we, I can say anything new, I'm not sure, but um, I hope to encourage you and inspire you on that this morning. And when we turn to the Bible, whenever it talks about prayer, it is always inspirational and sets a big picture for us. Revelation 5.21, um, uh, 5.12, it says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. That when we think of Jesus, we're thinking of the significant one, of the most amazing one. And he said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And so as we consider that, we, we pray that his blessing will be upon us and that he will guide us. The scriptures say, rejoice in the Lord always, praying without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The psalmist says, I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. 
Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. We're going to sing together our opening song this morning as we come into worship and we're going to sing All My Days. So let's do what we're thinking about today. Let's join together as we pray. Lord, this morning we come to worship you as God. That's why we're here. And we deceive ourselves if we bow here with heads with doubts in them or questions of who you are or what you are or what you have done. Because you are from eternity existing before anything began, before anything was established, and you will be beyond this time and space that we recognize as that which we live in. Therefore, we have to acknowledge that you are beyond our comprehension, even outside the reach of our imaginings and dreams. You are all-powerful, you are all-knowing, you are ever-present, who is with us in all things and with whom anything and all things incomprehensible are possible. You've demonstrated this in the great acts of Scripture and in the resurrection of Jesus. But though incomprehensible, 
You have made yourself known to us through the story of the Bible, in the intricacies of the universe and nature, and in the person of Jesus. You want us to know you. You want us to have a, a fuller picture of who you are, to be close to you. You want to be in our lives. You want to empower our lives and fill them with purpose and joy. We're sorry, Lord, that it's more often that we wonder about you in the uncertain sense. We're unsure, unclear about you as God and what you can do in a physical existence. We let that then shape and even define our faith, leaving it impaired, full of questions and devoid of expectations. And so we don't find inspiration when we worship and when we serve you. And we find no motivation in our discipleship. Forgive us, Lord, through the power of the resurrection which can overcome sin. Forgive us and reset us with your filling and filling us with wonder in a good sense, where we're full of wonder and awe, and that you would open our hearts and minds to the limitless help and the blessings that you can bring. So teach us this morning and drive us to the place of prayer, not out of obligation, but from a recognition of needs and wants. We thank you that you do not want us to operate as soul nomads in this life, wandering around ourselves, but rather as a family with you as our Father, who provides for our needs as they arise. So come, Holy Spirit, among us. Come among us and, and prepare us and ready us for your ministry. Open our eyes to the possibility of the impossible and bring us to a place of awe and wonder at the acts of God, not only in days that are gone, but in days that are being lived now and that are yet to be. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have two readings this morning. The first is taken from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 5 through to verse 15. Um, if you're looking in the Pew Bibles, it's page 9 in the New Testament section. And uh, this is Jesus teaching about prayer and, of course, turning to and using the words for the first time of what we call the Lord's Prayer. So Matthew 6 and beginning of verse 5, this is God's Word. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand up and pray in the houses of worship and on the street corners so that everyone will see them. I assure you they have already been paid in full. But when you pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what you do in private will reward you. When you pray, do not use a lot of meaningless words as the pagans do, who think that their gods will hear them because their prayers are long. Do not be like them. Your Father already knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, may your holy name be honored. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us the wrongs we have done as we forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. Do not bring us to hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. If you forgive others the wrongs they have done to you, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive the wrongs that you have done. Amen. And we pray that God will add his blessing to this reading. Boys and girls, come up to the front. I'll come and see you now. Great to see you today. Great to see you today. I have a couple of things that are in my pockets that really bug me. I'm just going to get them out. First of all, 
couple of batteries. You know, you know what we use batteries for, don't you? Yeah, we use them to charge them. Okay, we, we use it to charge things and, and get power to things. So I'll just leave those there because they're they're kind of a hassle. Let's wrap them in my pocket here. Um, I like to carry screwdrivers around with me. You never know when you might need them. Um, ever seem to need them, but I carry them around with me anyway. So I'm just leaving them here. Just a bit of tick. That's me. There's no rattling or things annoying me. It's, when things rattle and annoy me, they really annoy me. So that's them done with. What I've done today is I've brought something that Zoe made in our house just recently. It's a four cylinder engine. Okay? It's a four cylinder engine. Yep, there we are. It's, it's great. It's a, what, what do you call a working model? So it actually, it's obviously not an, a four cylinder engine to power a car with, but it is a four cylinder engine. And, um, and you, you just have to press that button and, and it works here. And so, so can you show me where you, I'll say it now, I'll say it now. Press it, just press this. Sorry. Hmm. That is the button, isn't it? It is? Okay. Um, and that comes off, and that's the, the, the battery pack. I, it doesn't might have no batteries on it. Do you know? Okay, but yeah, so, so what you're saying is if I had batteries and put the batteries in, then then there might be power. Okay. It's not a real shame. It's not a real shame. Batteries, I mean, batteries. Anybody got any batteries? No, I don't have any. But I'm, I'm afraid of I'm not sure if I can use those batteries because they're very special, but I'm not sure if I could use them. And anyway, I would need a, I don't know, how, how do you get them to that battery? A, a screwdriver. So there we are, that's that over. So our next song is, is that okay? No? What? I've got the screwdriver. I'm, I'm not sure if I can use it. Just try it. Okay, well, well, let's see. If I bring them over, let's see what we can do. Okay. Okay, can anybody see? Because my I need a straight screwdriver or a star screwdriver. And a string. I think it might be. Where do we try this? Where do we try this from here? And we'll put it in. So. So uh, that's amazing. I never knew it. So if I put that in there and turn that around like that, it, it opens up. So so because because I've used this little screwdriver, I now can put the power under the is that what you think? I do. <laughs> okay, that's That's shaky hands, that's, that's what happens when you get old. Your hands get all shaky and you can't get there. Right, okay, so I have used the screwdriver. Let's give everybody an update. I have used the screwdriver. The screwdriver allowed me to take this little door off. And when the door came off, we were able to put the batteries in, which means the power has gone in, and I was able to screw the, the thing back on. So, so, so because I've used the screwdriver and opened the back, We've got the batteries in, we've screwed it up again. You're saying when I now press this button, it'll work. Are you sure? Because engines need what? Engines need loads of power to operate. Right, are we ready? Five, four, three, two, one. It's going. Look. And you can see all the little valves going up and down and different lights as if it's the engine firing. Isn't that cool? 
Zoe made that from scratch. It was just a pile of screws, bits of plastic, and springs and belts, and she built it all and got it going herself. Now, I'm going to leave it there because I'm reliably informed it runs for 45 seconds and then it switches off. Do you know what I'm trying to tell you today? Sometimes we're sad, sometimes we're sick, sometimes we're afraid, sometimes we're not sure. Sometimes we love, sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sometimes we are sometimes we are Okay, right. Oh, 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 oh. You, that's that's everything. That's all the things that I was going to talk about. So thank you so much. That was brilliant. Um, we go through all kinds of things, and we need help. We need help when we're afraid. We need help when we're uh, worried about something or whatever. And do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, "I have given to each one of you a special gift." It allows you to, to connect, to get the power into you, to help you not to be afraid, to help you to have courage, to help you to make decisions, to help you know what's right and wrong, to help you to feel better again. And he says it's a bit like a little screwdriver. And it's called prayer. And you use it to get the power into you. Now, if you don't use it, then it's very hard to get the power into you. You need to ask for the power to come to you. So he says, when you are all these things, and lots, lots more, what I want you to do is to pray and ask me to help you. And when you do, that unlocks or opens up the power to come into you and to help you in all the ways that you do. The, re the funny thing is, you seem quite surprised that I would walk around with a screwdriver, and yet when I needed a screwdriver, I wouldn't use it. And yet that's what most people do with prayer. They go, I, I've been told what prayer can do, but it wouldn't work for me. Or I wouldn't know how to use it. I, I might try and screw my head open or something like that. I wouldn't know what to do. When Jesus just says, and we've just read it, go to your room, close the door, and talk to God. And tell him, just tell him what, what you want him to know, what you want to ask him. Just tell him. So prayer is very, very important, and it opens up the most amazing things for us. We're going to sing your song now, and it's a song, and it's one of the ways that we, we use prayer, we use prayer to praise Jesus, and it's called We Want to See Jesus Lifted High, and if you step back, you'll see it up there. <laughs>
We're going to bring our prayers of intercession now and do our second reading just before um, the sermon. So let's join together as we pray for others. It is a blessing, Lord, that we can bring all situations to you in prayer, that we can lift a screwdriver to open up the access to the power and, and allow that power to be put into place. It's a privilege that we can speak to you on behalf of others and plead their cause. It is a thrill to return with thanksgiving when we've seen you answer in all kinds of ways. With Easter past, we pray that there would not be a decrease in our sense of worship. That's one of the big two festivals over for the year, and we're in the spring and the summer is coming and we can pack you away and, and leave you until the autumn again. Help us to remember there is no greater pursuit in this life than pursuing you. Fan into flame the gift of the Holy Spirit in all who follow Jesus, and give a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline in such a way that others will notice it and want to and will start to follow Jesus themselves, that the gospel would become a good and a positive pandemic that brings life. Today, we're asked to remember the work of the Baltic Reformed Theological College in Latvia, not a part of the world that we're very familiar praying about at all, and yet one that is at the forefront of global tensions with an expansive Russia policy right on its doorstep. We pray for the tensions and for the security of the borders of that country. And we pray for the work of the seminary, especially the president, the Reverend Alvis Sauka, and the director, Artis Clemens, as they develop its work, not least, um, and, and not least a project that they're involved in in central Latvia. Lord, it wasn't all that long ago that we would never have even heard of this place and, and that we certainly would have, wouldn't have been praying for Christian work there. And so we pray that um, you will move in this part of the world and consolidate and bless the work that's taking place there. We pray for the taking care work of the Presbyterian Church and for the temporary administrator who, who's in post at the minute, dealing with inquiries and liaising with congregational de designated persons, dealing with training and ad administration of the access NI checks. Lord, this is a crucial role and a crucial example to be set by the church. We pray for our own uh, designated persons, uh, Michael White and Ruth McCubrey, and praying that um, you would bless them as they keep an oversight of all that goes on within our congregation. And we pray for youth groups and children's work, as well as work among adults and including the elderly, that the work that we do would be marked by integrity and safety and care and uh, a, a genuine uh, desire to, to look after the needs of those of all ages and stages in life in the congregation. We pray for our engagement with the local community, praying that you would open doors of further opportunity for us to welcome in and to demonstrate the love of Christ. Particularly, we pray for events later in the spring, the plant sale and a shared event with Love Bally Home, that they will give us an opportunity to connect with those who only see our church as the building at the corner of two streets, beside the school. Help us to take full opportunity of these events as we welcome people in and as we pray to see returning faces and new faces coming here to church week by week. We also remember those who are ill at the moment or who are faithful for coming days or who are feeling the pain of grief. We pray for their comfort and for their healing, that you would bring them through these darker days and bring them to brighter days again. And of course, we bring to you our own private prayers, the things that matter to us, the things that are weighing heavily upon our minds. We pray that we may take the opportunity to lay those things before you, that we would not just keep them to ourselves and wrap them all up and, and spend night after night tossing and turning in bed, worrying about them, but that we would place them into your hands and that we would see tangible, tangible responses to, to the prayers that we bring. 
And so we lay these things before you today, praying that you will hear them and that in your wisdom you'll respond to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Just before we turn to our thoughts for this morning, we're going to sing again, and we're going to sing words taken from the 23rd Psalm, The Lord's My Shepherd. The relationship I've had with my sister has been an interesting one over the years. She was born when I was just a few weeks short of being 15. And so for much of my life, she's, she has been, um, certainly um, until she was married, she was this child that lived with my parents. And I think she looked at me as this, this fella who keeps turning up um, at my mum and dad's house and seems to know them quite well. Um, that has as the years have passed and as we've got older, um, and maybe the 15 years as we've got older and 15 years proportionately become shorter, and the gap seems to be uh, shrinking as the years go by. The day before my mum died, um, um, I was, we were sitting by the, the hospital bed, as many of you will have done, and uh, Nicola had gone out and my mum turned to me and she said, would you look after Nicola? And uh, I said, of course I will. Um, and that was, that was one of the, the, the sort of last instructions uh, that, that she gave to me in, in her lifetime. So what do you think I do now? Do you think I go, well, thank goodness she's gone. I can forget about that now. Um, I can uh, set that to one side. Uh, no, you can bet your bottom dollar. Um, if you want to bet from the pulpit, um, uh, you can be sure 
I'm seeking to carry it out. And I think I've taken more proactive action in her life in the past six months than I have in the previous um, 40 plus years. Um, and I uh, see her a lot more. I am in communication with her a lot more uh, th than I would have been because I've, I said I would look after her. And so uh, that, that is what I will do. So as, as Paul is coming to the end of his, his letter to the Colossians, I mean, he's been saying a lot of things to them and, and uh, giving them a lot of challenges, but it's almost like, it's almost like a, he takes off the glasses and sets down the, pe the pen and actually s speaks to them as opposed to writing something formal to them. And his, his words become a bit more personal. And he gives them some final instructions. And what he is doing is he's saying to them, as, as people who have taken up this new life following Jesus, who now find themselves swimming against the cultural tide, here's a few things I, I want you to do. And so he gives a number of instructions. And so because, they're, because as I looked at them, I thought they're actually really significant things I have decided to pause over them for a few weeks. And so today is the first instruction, and it's only uh, two verses in uh, Colossians chapter 4, which I'm going to read now, uh, or three verses, and uh, it's about prayer. And he says this, Be persistent in prayer and keep alert as you pray, giving thanks to God. At the same time, pray also for us so that God will give us a good opportunity to preach his message about the secret of Christ. For that's why I am now in prison. Pray then that I may speak as I should in such a way as to make it clear. So he, he actually asks them or requests two things of them when he comes to the whole subject of prayer. First thing he says is, um, he has here, be, uh, this translation has be persistent. The New International Version has devote yourselves to prayer. Now, they're powerful words and therefore words that we should take n notice of. He's really saying, never give up. Don't be weary. Pray diligently. Keep at it. Keep going. Now, why does he say that? Well, I think obviously it's the glaring answer. This first answer is, because we could easily give up. Sometimes when we pray, it can feel like we're just talking to ourselves. It's almost like you could be in the middle of a prayer and you catch yourself on and you hear your own voice and you go, this is utterly ridiculous. Sometimes it feels like our prayers just hit the ceiling and they never get any further than that and they just keep bouncing up and down but never really um, reaching their, their um, intended destination. Sometimes it feels like our voice gets lost in the noise of life and that all the big things that go on around us and the, all the big things that go on in the world around us make prayer sound like um, uh, a silly thing. Um, I, I have a book that I have right in front of me. There it is there. Um, I'm going to recommend, um, which I'll re recommend in a, in a short time, um, but it's uh, in it, um, in the opening chapter, the guy talks about prayer, and he said, I imagine prayer like this. There's the monk with the, the hairdo and the brown, scratchy-looking uh, gown on, and he's praying in front of a temple in the wild west of America. And in front of him, on two huge stallions, are the Lone Ranger and Tonto. And... Uh, um, the, the, the monk says to the Lone Ranger, I want to go with you, I want to help you, because they're in the pursuit of these terrible bodies. And the Lone Ranger says to him, no, you stay here. It's too dangerous for you. Um, you pray for us. And with that, the horses ride up and do wheelies or whatever those things that the horses do, you call. And off the two, uh, Tonto and, and uh, the Lone Ranger head off to where all the action is in the distance. And wherever the action is, it's not where the man praying is. And wherever it's the men go, that's not where the men tend to stay. It doesn't feel like it's an important thing to do. The other way that we might give up is that we have prayed and we have been genuine and very sincere. 
and nothing happens. And we're sort of, gee, that's an hour has passed and nothing happened. That's a week has passed. That's a month. That's a year. And I see no answer at all. And in that, we begin to go, forget it. When those times come, and they, they definitely come, it'd be stupid to think that they don't come. Strengthen your prayers with honesty. And say, Lord, I feel like giving up here. I feel like packing this all in. This feels like a waste of my time because I'm not seeing anything. Tell them those kinds of things so that there can be a response to that. Psalm 13, how much longer, Lord, will you forget about me? Will it be forever? How long will you hide? How long must I be confused and miserable all day? How long will my enemies keep beating me down? Please listen, Lord God, and answer my prayers. That's the psalmist, and he's being honest. He's, he's struggling. He's finding it heavy going. And so he says, so I'm going to tell you, this is, this is how I'm feeling. Those who keep going, who, who never give up, who devote themselves, who don't grow weary in their praying, they become the people who have the stories to tell, who see the answers. I did, a number of years ago, a challenge um, and it was related to prayer. And I said, I want you to think about something that's, that's on your mind at the minute. And I want you to pray for the next 40 days about that issue. It doesn't have to be a long prayer at all. Three, four lines. Pray it every day for 40 days. And I will be very surprised if after 40 days, there's not something, some sign it may not be a dramatic splitting the sky open answer, but you don't see some kind of progression in what you pray about. I, I threw out that challenge. One person came back to me and said, I did that. And here's what happened. And they, they were able to tell me a story of something that shifted from A, not to B, but to maybe C or D. But the fact that it was only one person makes me conclude that the rest either didn't start at all or didn't go for the whole 40 days. That's what Paul means when he says, devote yourselves, keep at it, do not give up. Don't give up at all. Secondly, um, I think he says, devote yourself to prayer because Paul understands the vital importance of prayer. Because when we pray, it gives God his place and it lets us take our place. And, and we, we give a recognition that God is above us. It allows God to work in, through, and around us. It, it is the way by which we access his power. And this has a profound impact upon us. As we see our prayers being responded to, it motivates us more, and so on. Psalm 116, I love you, Lord. You answered my prayers. You paid attention to me. And so I will pray to you as long as I live. You can see how the journey it has taken the psalmist on. He prayed. The answer came. And so the, the, it's the logical conclusion. Why would I not keep doing this if that's what happens in this? Why would I not do it about well, that and that and, and that and that and that and that? And we could keep praying about all kinds of things. So he says, devote yourselves to prayer being watchful. And by that he means as if you're lying awake at night waiting for something. When we were in our last church, um, we had a, a, a youth intern, a young girl who came and worked with us for the guts of a year from the United States, from Seattle. And her name is Lindsay Steinmetz. Lindsay was... A very, 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 very pretty girl. And uh, I was amazed you would walk, th I would walk through Coleraine um, with her. And men, well, not men, boys would stop and talk to her. And I was thinking, nobody ever stops to talk to me when I walk through this place. Yet when Lindsay comes, everybody's my friend and welcoming. Oh, no, you, Peter, all oh, right. And, and, and so on. She did the Port Ballon Trace CSSM team with us. And all the boys fancied her. And one eventually plucked up the courage 
um, and asked her out and nearly passed out when she said, okay, and uh, they went out uh, for an evening. She was living with Heather and I at the time, and we were uh, late 20s. And um, the young man came and picked her up, and the young man is now a GP, um, so he's, he was a respectable young man. He was from a, a good family and all that kind of thing. They said they'd be back at 11. Well, 11 came and went. 11.30 and 12 and 12.30. And according to one, I was walking up and down the bedroom going, this is utterly ridiculous. He knows what he's doing. He's winding us up and, and so on. I was, my senses were incredibly heightened for the car coming through. Um, the, the entrance into the manse had a cattle grill. And so when a car drove through, you, you heard the of uh, going over the cattle grill. And I was waiting for it. They came and then spent another two and a half hours sitting chatting in the kitchen. And I was waiting for his car driving away and to hear her going down to her room. Paul says, pray with that heightened sense of, of, of observation. Watch, be watchful, firstly, for the opportunity to pray. You know, you can pray for church. You can pray for your family. You can pray for yourself. You can pray for the world around you, your family, your friends, and um, things that are going on in the world. You cannot definitely say, I do not know what to pray for. Because if you say that, then you have no idea what's going on in your life at all. So I could think of umpteen things right now to start praying for, for myself, never mind for anything else. So you can be watchful for opportunities to pray for yourself. You can also be watchful for answers. Because sometimes when it's like when, we, when we're engaging in prayer, it's like we're playing thunder and lightning. Now, this game has a different name depending on where you live. So what I'm talking about is running up to a door, knocking the door, ringing the doorbell, and running off. Um, sometimes we do that. We, we go to God, we, we, we knock, and we give a prayer, but before anything happens, we've bolted again, and we're, we're half a mile down the road, because we're afraid, perhaps, well, if God answers my prayer, what do I do? Because then he has shown himself to me a bit, and, and what do I do? Because I, I don't know if I really want to do all that stuff. Um, and so we, we run away. Sometimes we lay our prayers out before him. I say, I'm really, really worried. This, this, is, this is driving me mad, and I'm, I'm uh, not sleeping at night, and I'm thinking about it all through the day, about this subject. I, will you please take it and help me with it? And we say, amen, and we go, so I'll just be taking that all back with me. Thank you very much. And we carry it away with us again, and we lie and roll around in bed at night, and we think about it all day long, because actually we haven't left it with God at all. We've come and taken it back for ourselves. I remember when Alan Abernethy was, was here, and he told me about a practice that he had. He said, each night I would go to my study, and there would usually be a few things from the day that... Um, had bugged me or that um, I was worried about or upset about. So what I would do is I would just pray and say, Lord, here are the things from today. And I would write each of them on a sticky piece of uh, a post-it note. I'd peel them off and he had a, he had a little cross that sat on his, on his desk. And he, he said, he stuck them to the cross. He said, I'm leaving them here with you. They're now your issue. I'm letting go of them in laying them before you. Psalm 5, verse 3. Each morning you listen to my prayer as I bring my requests and wait for your reply. But the million dollar question is, are we expectant when we pray? Are we going to be watchful? Or do we mouth words that actually mean nothing? So when you pray, do you expect that in some way the Lord will answer your prayer? Not, not always yes, but do you expect that an answer will come? Because if you don't, um, then you're, you're deflating it all before you even begin. And that requires us to trust. 
to trust God and to trust the promises. Mark 11, everything you ask for in prayer will be yours if only you have faith. John 14, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Of course, that can sound like I will, if you say, Lord, I need a million pounds by tomorrow, that you open your door tomorrow morning and there'll be an envelope with a million pounds sitting in it. It doesn't quite work that way. But a response does come. A response definitely comes. It's very important that we are trusting and watchful, especially if we if the response initially is, right, wait. And that can be sometimes the most difficult. Um, if a yes comes, brilliant. If a no comes, well, we have to take the no um, as, as, as being something. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, it's when a wait, a wait, hold on, hang fire. And when that comes, I think it's again important that we go back to him in prayer and say, I'm really struggling here. I'm, I, I, you know, I, I'm back to the place where I feel like I might give up. Can you show me some way or reassure me some way that you've heard, at least heard me? And I believe God would respond to that through the Bible. And that's where, and again, I've said it before, it's where consistent Bible reading comes through. It's not so that you're picking up the Bible and like a horoscope going and reading the first verse that you see, but where you're methodically going through a passage or something using notes that have been decided by someone else so that when something stands out to you, you, you know it's standing out to you and you know it has come to you for that particular day. So he says, be watchful. The second thing he says is be thankful. And it's important that we are thankful. We teach our children the importance of saying thank you when someone gives them something or is kind to them or whatever. Because when you're thankful, it demonstrates that you've noticed what has been done. It shows that you've recognized who's behind it. It shows that you appreciate what has, what has taken place. Remember the 10 lepers? Only one of them said thank you. And I think you would have to conclude that only one felt truly thankful, more than the other nine got what they wanted. But one was truly thankful. So it's very important that we say thank you. Because if we come to an answer that is different to the request that we have made, it is important that we still say, Lord, I thank you for answering my prayer. It wasn't what I asked, but you have answered it. And it shows to God that you know that God knows best. And in whatever way he has responded, actually in the long term, that response will be better for me. I've, I've encountered that myself. Where I've prayed for A, and the answer was no, and then B came. And actually, the day came when I realized B was far, far better me than A would have ever been. We know the, the, um, the Bible verses, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It encourages us to be more thankful and also more trusting in how we, in how we do that as we watch for the answers coming. That's the first big request with, with those two things. Devote yourselves being watchful and thankful. And then the second request is pray for us. See, Paul knew the power that lies in prayer and that prayer gives access to it. He knew that it wasn't the power of prayer. He knew it was the power to whom he was praying. Like the, the, the screwdriver and the batteries, and the power came in. It wasn't the screwdriver that put the power in. The power was placed in after the screwdriver had been used. Now, computers are amazing things. They can perform, they can help us to communicate with people through email. They can perform very complex tasks. They can play music or show you a movie. They can give you access to the internet. You can shop on them, bank on them, learn a new skill on them, and lots and lots of other things. But none of those things are possible unless the computer's plugged into the electric power. Unless the computer is powered by electric or charged up through the power thing and then you can detach it, but the power needs to be there because without it, that computer can do nothing. It's just a, a lump of plastic and metal and screws and little processors and stuff like that. 
Without it, there is nothing. John 16, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive it. James 4, you do not have because you do not ask God. Prayer is crucial in ministry, in the lives of individuals and in churches. Where that is understood, you find individuals and churches who tend to be in a stronger position. You can see it as visibly there. You do not find a place where there's devotion to prayer and it's absent of God doing anything. Paul knew himself that he couldn't rest on his laurels. He had a reputation. He had past experience that he could point to. I was involved in this and that happened. He had mission successes where he set up a church and it went well. He had the story of his own conversion. He had the name. People knew who he was. But he still needed to pray. It wasn't that I've, I've sussed out how to be a Christian leader and so I can just coast along in my own steam now. He knew I still need to pray every day. Even Jesus, John 5, or Luke chapter 5, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And if Jesus knew he needed to do that, if that's actually what Jesus did, then how much more you and me? Paul knew prayer support meant he never had to say, there's nothing I can do here. I have no idea what, what can be done. When his energies, ideas, and options seemed out, he knew God would supply in response to prayer. And we know that because in Acts chapter 16, Paul is traveling. He's on his second missionary journey. He is traveling. He's looking for a location to go. I'm not going to go into the, the, the locations, but here's the responses to his prayers. Yes, no, no, wait. And when he came to the wait, he was in uh, the port of Troas, and it was, it was just hang fire. And during the night, he had a dream, and he, after consulting with the others and praying, they knew next day that it was guidance to go to uh, Philippi, which brought the message of Jesus out of Asia and into Europe. 2 Corinthians 1, please help us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks for the blessings we receive in answer to all these prayers. Whether it's practical help, whether it's courage we need, or resources, or ideas, or support, or finances, or opportunities, all these things come when people get on their knees and ask God and pray to him. That's why he asks the Colossians to pray for him. He's imprisoned and he said, I need, I need God's help in this situation. And we should remember the same. And so he says, so when you pray for us, two requests. Number one, that there would be an open door for our message. It's interesting because he could have said, can you open the doors of the prison and get me out of here? But instead he asked for the door of opportunity to tell people about Jesus whilst within an imprisonment context. This was the very reason. He, he's praying, let us be able to tell Jesus, uh, pe tell people about Jesus. That was the very reason he was in prison in the first place. And that's significant for the Christians in Colossians, in a city where no one wanted to know about their faith or took great offense at it when it was talked about. Instead, they could ask God, with whom all things are possible, that those same people would be interested, would not take offense, and would listen. And we're bang there in the modern day. Um, most people are not interested in the slightest about what we talk about. And there are those who would take great offense at, at what we talk about. So we need to do what Paul is specifically saying here. We need to do this as a church, that God would give the opportunity to, to open the door in this area that we're a part of where we can talk about Jesus to people. And the second thing and final thing, to proclaim it as I should. So he's, he's saying, give me an opportunity to speak about Jesus in the way that it needs to be done. Clearly, in a way that people can understand, not leaving them bamboozled where they, they go, what on earth was he talking about? Boldly, 
without restraint or fear. Um, the full truth, not a watered down version of it. The Bible says it's the truth, the whole truth that sets people free. Graciously, where we don't lord it over people, where we don't come, I'm a Christian and you're not, so I'm better than you, that we definitely do not take that kind of line. And wisely, where we, we work out where people are, what's relevant to people, and we try and connect with them at that level. And, and we, we communicate with them at that level. So in church at the moment, we currently have two small prayer groups, notwithstanding that there may be people in private prayer praying for church. I checked um, our figures um, that uh, are in the last blue book, um, the statistical book of the Presbyterian Church, um, referred to 450 people claiming connection to our congregation. So we reckon it's about 16 people are in the two prayer groups. It's 3.5%. So if prayer is the engine room of the church, as, as some describe it that, then we're operating with an engine at three, we're operating at 3.5%. And an engine operating at 3.5% will reveal itself in its impact, in its energy, in its attendances, in its givings, in its service, in its atmosphere. Imagine if it was 35%. Imagine what our experience of church might be like. You know, because it's not that God only answers prayers that a certain number of people pray. God will answer the prayer of one person. But there is a, a, a democracy of prayer where people express numerically their desire for what they want to see God do. And he takes notice of that. There is no question about that. And we could say, well, goodness, I, I'm not great at praying and I don't know what to say and, and, and so on. Well, let's, everybody starts with things simply um, and start with simple prayers. Um, in our uh, Zoom prayer time, a number of people write their prayers. There's utterly nothing wrong with that. Sometimes we think you have to be able to sit and spontaneously pray and bring out all these fancy theological and, and religious expressions and catchphrases and stuff. No, you don't. Jesus just said, do not do that. Sp speak honestly, simply from your heart. If we pray for five minutes a day, that's not 0.3% of our day. Imagine what it might be if we turned it to 3% of our day or 23% of our day or whatever. We need to pray. It is the most unused resource that the church has. Most churches will try everything else, literally everything else, but praying about things. Without um, trying to run a car, it's, it's like trying to run a car on nothing, or run your home where the trip switch has gone off, or trying to live your life and, and live your life at full tilt and never eating. You know that in any of those things, it'll grind a halt very, very quickly. So pray, pray, pray for yourself. Pray for your family and friends. Pray for your community. Pray for the nation. Pray for the world. Let's see what changes we can see happen as we talk to God about it. Pray for our church. Pray for it in, in the current context, this post-COVID world that we're in and the, the impact that COVID has had upon the church. Pray for it. Pray that God will change it and that he'll reverse the negative effects that have come. Because when people pray, coincidences happen. When people pray, you find stories start to be told. When people pray, you start to notice changes taking place. When people pray, those people start to talk about blessing in their lives. So pray, pray, pray. Grab it. Take the opportunity. Don't be an idiot walking around with a screwdriver and going, and you need a screwdriver and you're going, you, you mean this one? Oh, I couldn't be this one. I wouldn't use this one. That wouldn't. When the Lord's saying, that's the very thing I've given to you to use. So pray for all that you need to pray about. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, 
We're sorry that often it's there right in front of us. It's the very thing that we need to use and it's the last thing that we turn to. Father, change us in response to this prayer this morning. Change us to start to engage in prayer, even if it's to start very simply, and we might even think um, in a silly way to start with, let us start to pray and to put things before you and answer our prayers in ways that we can see so that it will motivate and inspire us and move us to pray all the more. And let us be a people who pray, a church that prays, who makes an impact And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The name of the book is uh, Don't Just Stand There, Pray Something. Um, It is, uh, now it's out quite a long time ago. You're probably more looking at Amazon or somewhere like that. um, But you'll get it on Amazon, I'm certain, um, uh, uh, for little. Um, Or you might find it down in, you will find it down in uh, Faith Mission on High Street as well. But uh, very it's an entertaining read. Um, he throws in lots of funny stories and stuff like that as well. So it's it's not oh, it's going to be a heavy, heavy book on prayer. He explains it very easily and simply uh, and relevantly for us. So don't just stand there, pray something. And as we come to the end of our service, we're going to sing our final hymn. And it is one that picks up on what we've talked about. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. Let's sing this together.
So, Lord, take these gifts that we bring and may your blessing be upon them and send us out into this week renewed in confidence and hope in you, inspired, willing to step out and to pray and to bring our requests before you. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and remain with us always. Amen.